AMD Zen 4 based Ryzen 7000 series processors were introduced with a generally positive reception when they launched back in September 2022. Performance was strong, frequency was impressive, and the overall platform features were very user friendly. With that said, it wasn't all plain sailing. The 170 watt TDP Ryzen chips guzzled power and they ran at lofty temperatures, often hitting 95 degrees Celsius. And the story wasn't too dissimilar for the 105 watt TDP Ryzen 7 and Ryzen 5 either. With those points in mind, as well as the proven excellent performance even at lower power levels, AMD has made the decision to release 65 watt TDP non-X chips in the form of Ryzen 9 7900, Ryzen 7 7700 and Ryzen 5 7600. Other than the reduced TDP and therefore operating frequencies, these non-X chips are practically the same as their X-rated siblings. It's the same TSMC 5 nanometer process, the same 32 megs of L3 cache per core chiplet, and the same I.O. die with PCIe Gen 5, DDR5 and RDNA2 iGPU support. AMD does however include a Wraith Prism cooler with the Ryzen 7 and Ryzen 9, and the Wraith Stealth cooler with the Ryzen 5. So that's a nice free inclusion. Pricing for AMD's new non-X chips at the time of shooting this video is suggested to see the Ryzen 9 7900 at around about 429 US dollars, the Ryzen 7 7700 at around about 329 US dollars, and the Ryzen 5 7600 at 229 US dollars. So will those suggested lower price points compared to the X-rated parts and the inclusion of the free and decent Wraith Prism Cooler? Will they make the Ryzen 9 7900 and Ryzen 7 7700 tempting propositions? Let's take a closer look at the performance for the two chips that we have here today. We will be putting the new Ryzen 7000 series non-X processors against their logical competitors, so Ryzen 7000, Ryzen 5000, Intel 12th gen and Intel 13th gen. There is a lot of data in our charts, so we have filtered some of the uh, older processors out, but you can check back to see that data with our previous reviews on the Kikuru webpage or on the previous Kikuru videos done by myself and Leo. So make sure you do that. Both DDR5 platforms use 32 gigabytes, 6,000 megahertz sets from G-Skills Trident Z5 range, though the timings differ slightly with the AMD Expo kit run at 30, 38, 38, 96 versus the Intel XMP set at 36, 36, 36, 96 but this is pretty close between the two sets. The new AMD processors are tested on Gigabyte's X670E Aorus master motherboard, and looking at the VRM solution, including the cooling on this motherboard, yeah, we're not gonna have to worry about downclocking on the motherboard side of things, that's for sure. We've enhanced our CPU testing setup to include an AMD Radeon RX 6950 XT graphics card for pixel pushing power. We specifically chose the 6950 XT thanks to its superb performance at 1080p and 1440p resolutions, the former of which is critical for assessing CPU gaming capabilities. And our specific board of choice is the monstrously large and tremendously well-cooled Sapphire Nitro Plus Pure model. We've also enhanced the power supply setup with Seasonic's new 1600 watt Prime models delivering clean and consistent juice. And then all platforms also get a 360 millimeter all-in-one liquid cooler on the open air test bench. And we keep this consistent despite the new 65 watt parts shipping with the Wraith CPU coolers. We want to ensure consistency between the test data. With regards to test procedures, it's the usual setup for us. So make sure you check out the full details on the Kikuru written webpage and our previous videos. Our gaming tests are going to focus on 1080p because this is the high FPS domain whereby differences in CPU performance are under the spotlight. So we're going to focus on that specifically. And as always, if you've got any more questions, then chuck them in the comment section down below and I'll do my best to get back to you. Let's jump into some of the performance numbers. But first, let's see how these new processors operate with regards to their frequencies. Starting out with a look at operating frequencies, this is an obvious area where these new 65 watt TDP non-X parts have a deficit versus their X rated siblings. The Ryzen 9 7900 runs around 4.35 gigahertz all core under a Cinebench workload, whereas the stock Ryzen 9 7900X by comparison was pushing 5.1 gigahertz. The Ryzen 7 7700 runs around 4.9 gigahertz all core in Cinebench, this is around 250 to 300 megahertz slower than the Ryzen 7 7700X. For overclocking, I did run Curve Optimizer, but this result actually came in unstable when running 7-zip and handbrake benchmark testing. So instead, I reverted back to 
good old Precision Boost Overdrive, which I think is a really smart one-click way to run these chips, particularly because you're saving some money, and hopefully with PBO, you should be getting X-level stock performance. So, what are the frequencies for PBO? Let's have a look. With the higher power budget allocated to it, the Ryzen 9 7900 run at 5.05 GHz under its PBO all-core load. This is only 50 MHz slower than the stock Ryzen 9 7900X, which is also effectively power unlimited. So that's a good comparison for the non-X chip. The Ryzen 7 7700 measured in at 5.07 GHz all-core, which is just over 100 MHz slower than the default Ryzen 7 7700X. In short, PBO looks to be an excellent way to run these cheaper non-X processors close, but not quite at, so close to the performance of the more expensive X-rated siblings if you have competent CPU cooling hardware. So, as always with AMD, as we've seen historically, particularly with the Ryzen 3000 series, for example, the non-X chips and the cheaper price tag, that doesn't really mean you get a worse processor if you're happy to use Precision Boost Overdrive. Looking at power consumption, the new 65 watt TDP non-X AMD processors are absolutely excellent. 65 watt TDP in the AMD design translates into 88 watts of allowable package power. This is an incredibly low power draw number by modern high performance CPU standards. And it makes the non-X parts PSU friendly by even Ryzen 5 and Core i5 standards. The Ryzen 9 7900X, for example, guzzles more than twice the power of the 7900 non-X under stock conditions. That is a huge difference. Zen 4 clearly has excellent abilities to run at reduced power levels, as these 65 watt TDP rated chips show. Modest power draw comes with the benefit of tolerable CPU temperatures, in theory, and in practice here. The stock clocked Ryzen 9 7900 is close to 50 degrees Celsius run-in temperature in our reasonably hot room ambient. Once again, we see the single CCD Ryzen chip running hotter. So that's the 7700, which is around 10 degrees higher operating temperature than the 7900 at the same power level. PBO removes the power shackles and treats these non-X chips more like their X siblings. As such, it comes as no surprise to see the Ryzen 7 hitting 84 degrees Celsius, while the Ryzen 9 runs over 90 degrees Celsius. Simply put, the included Wraith Prism Cooler will have no problems running these chips at sensible temperature levels, whilst also maintaining preferential clock speeds thanks to the Precision Boost 2 algorithm. And if you have a better CPU cooler, perhaps afforded by the cheaper cost of these non-X processors versus the X siblings, there is some headroom afforded via Precision Boost Overdrive overclocking. Looking at Blender Classroom, the stock Ryzen 9 7900 is well behind the 7900X thanks to its 750MHz frequency deficit. The 65W chip sits between a power unlimited Core i5-13600K and a Core i9-12900K. Precision Boost Overdrive sees both of those Intel chips blasted past though, with the 7900 and its 5.05GHz frequency effectively matching a stock 7900X. For the Ryzen 7 7700, it is noticeably behind the 7700X at stock, and even PBO cannot fully make up the deficit. AMD's new 65 watt chip is much quicker than the 6 core Ryzen 5 though. Cinebench multi-threaded testing sees a similar trend to Blender. The Ryzen 9 7900 is comparable to a power unlimited Core i5-13600K, but pushes close to the quick 7900X when overclocked via PBO. And the Ryzen 7 7700 is still well above the Zen 4 6 core and Zen 3 8 core. Single threaded performance isn't quite as strong on these 65 watt TDP parts when compared to other Zen 4 processors. Lower maximum boost clock frequencies for our test system are the cause here. Intel's high power 13th gen competitors are also very strong when it comes to single threaded grunt. So that's a bit of a loss for AMD on the 65 watt parts. Handbrake H264 sees the 24 thread Ryzen 9 doing well by competing nicely with a Core i5 13600K and Core i9 12900K, albeit at significantly lower power draw. PBO overclocking actually pushes the Ryzen 9 7900 above the 7900X, which is realistically a reflection of BIOS and AGISA updates in our test data. The Ryzen 7 7700 also does well in Handbrake H264, especially given its estimated price point. If this chip does come in a reasonable amount below the Core i5-13600K price point, which is currently £320 in the UK, it should be an appealing option. H265 performance in Handbrake is strong on Zen 4. 
And that is why we see the Ryzen 9 7900 doing well by competing against the Core i7 13700K. The Ryzen 7 7700 also closes the gap notably against the high power Core i5 13600K in this test. 7-zip compression performance has shown a sizable improvement on these new processors thanks to an AGISA and BIOS update on our test system. As such, the Ryzen 9 7900 appears better than the 7900X, which isn't really the case. It does highlight how competitive the 65 watt Ryzen's are against the higher powered competitors though. Decompression performance is excellent, with AMD's Ryzen 9 comfortably outperforming the Core i7, while the Ryzen 7 competes effectively against the juicy Core i5. If you care about 3D Mark performance, the new 65 watt TDP Ryzen chips will probably want a frequency bump via PBO or manual overclocking to make them more appealing for benchmarking. Moving on to gaming performance at 1080p, Borderlands 3 has clearly benefited from game, AGISA and BIOS updates since we tested the original Ryzen 7000 series processors. With that said, the new 65 watt Ryzen 7 and Ryzen 9 have no problems pushing out lofty frame rates of over 144 FPS average. Even the 1% lows are well above 100 FPS. Far Cry 6 is clearly frequency sensitive and this means that the non-X processors are a little behind the X siblings. There really isn't much in it though. And with the anticipated price savings of the non-X chips, they're perhaps better buys if you can spend that money on an upgraded graphics card. Hitman 3 is another result that looks very favourably on the Ryzen 9 7900. The Ryzen 7 7700 matches the 7700X perfectly too, so no problems with the non-X chips in this game. And Shadow of the Tomb Raider shows similar performance numbers between the X and non-X Ryzen 7000 parts, albeit with the Ryzen 9 7900 and our updated test platform having better 1% low results. Gaming performance on these new non-X chips looks to be absolutely fine versus the Intel and AMD X competitors. The reality is that you are likely to run out of GPU horsepower before hitting frame rates in excess of what the CPUs can handle. And that's especially true if you're gaming at 1440p or above, as we'd imagine most Ryzen 7 and Ryzen 9 buyers are. Looking at the Cinebench performance efficiency data, the Ryzen 9 7900 non-X is absolutely superb. In fact, the only better option in our chart is a 32-thread Ryzen 9 7950X with a massively constricted power allocation. The Ryzen 7 7700 does incredibly well too, and it manages to outperform any of the stock clocked competitors in our efficiency data. As is clear, the search for higher frequencies is not good for the Zen 4 power efficiency equation. That's where one-click precision boost overdrive can be beneficial though. You can run the chip efficiently for general usage and then crank up the power allocation when certain tasks dictate. To close things out then, I think that AMD's new 65 watt TDP non-X processors are a positive addition to the CPU market. The reality is that Intel's 12th gen and particularly the new 13th gen CPUs have been really tough for AMD to deal with over the past few months in the processor market. The Ryzen 9 7900X, Ryzen 7 7700X and Ryzen 5 7600X have had a really tough time competing with 13th gen, particularly due to the price points excluding the Black Friday deals of course. So these new chips and the more competitive price points that they will sit at can create some headaches for Intel. Plus many buyers will see value in a free CPU cooler that saves perhaps £30 or so from the initial system purchase cost. Looking at the platform side of things though, that is still an issue for AMD consumers. If you want a new Ryzen 7000 series non-X processor, you're still going to have to pay hefty prices for an AM5 motherboard and DDR5 memory. We're still holding out hope that AM5 motherboard pricing will continue to improve, perhaps with the launch of new lower powered models or lower spec models or perhaps lower power chipsets. And if that is the case, lower pricing for AM5 motherboards will be a particularly welcome point given the introduction of these new cheaper processors. If AMD decides upon price points for the Ryzen 9 7900 and Ryzen 7 7700 that undercut the Core i7 13700K and Core i5 13600K respectively, I think AMD will be onto a winner. Lower cost, power efficient Zen 4 processors that ship with a heatsink capable of handling their 88 watt stock load are good products to see on the market. Factor in the ease of pushing up very close to X rated processor performance levels at a few clicks and without cost, and it is easy to see why these new chips could become fan favorites. And that's just like so many of the Ryzen non-X processors have been throughout the years. 
Overall, I like the Ryzen 9 7900 a lot if it comes in around 400 pounds or less in the UK as the 429 US dollar pricing would suggest. That will give the Core i7-13700K a stellar run for its money, particularly when operating Precision Boost Overdrive or leveraging AMD superb out-of-the-box power efficiency. I think the Ryzen 7 7700 has a tougher battle simply because the Core i5-13600K is such an awesome processor and is such a tough one to compete against. At around £300 or less in the UK, which I think is probably going to be the case for the 7700, you're going to have to put emphasis on the lower power operation and AM5 features for this chip to make most sense. Intel's Core i5-13600K is still quicker than the Ryzen 7 7700 and it's about £320, so the pricing probably isn't going to be too dissimilar, but it could be. I don't have official pricing yet, so watch out for that one. On the downsides for Intel though, that 13600K does command more power and Intel's platform does have some feature downsides versus AM5. So yeah, this could be a battle that could become interesting, but I think the 13600K really is a tough chip to compete with. Intel has a bit of a diamond there in my opinion, particularly with the current pricing. Anyhow, I think that covers most of the points for the new Ryzen 9 7900 and Ryzen 7 7700 65 watt TDP rated AMD 7000 series Zen 4 processors. There's all the buzzwords that I can fit in. They're good additions to the market in my opinion. I think the lower price point for these AMD chips is good, particularly because the AM5 side of things, so the motherboard, is still pretty pricey. And if you're happy to go through that one-click overclocking via Precision Boost Overdrive, particularly if you spend that saved money on a better CPU cooler, then yeah, you're not really losing much, as has always been the case for the AMD non-X chips. So yeah, good additions to the market. I particularly like the Ryzen 9 7900, and I think the Ryzen 7 7700 is probably going to be a bit of a thorn in the side of the superb Core i5-13600K from Intel. So yeah, good to see some more competition on the CPU market. I've been Luke Hill for Kit Group. Thank you for watching our video review of the 65 watt rated AMD Ryzen 7000 series processors. As always, comments in the comment section down below, please. I'll do my best to respond to as many as I can, particularly with the rigors of CES going on. If you like this video, give us a like and subscribe. Do all that usual YouTube stuff. Please do check out the main written web page on the Kickroot website. That supports us massively, and there's more detail over there. Keep an eye out for the official pricing, because like I say, I don't have it confirmed as the time of shooting this video. Just some leaked pricing, which is probably roughly correct, to be honest. Uh, Twitter, Discord, Patreon, all the other social medias. Interact with us that way. Do check out our CES coverage if you haven't already, and I will catch you in the next video review.